hello all and welcome back from the break. Um, we could resume the afternoon session and it's, I'm Jamie Fraser from Children's National here in DC. And it's my pleasure to start the afternoon session off with Dr. Tomas Maitan, who is an assistant research professor at the University of Colorado on Schuss Medical Campus. And he's presenting his talk on enzyme therapy for homocystinuria, research and preclinical development of PEG-CBS. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me and presenting uh, on enzyme therapy for homocystinuria and our basic research and technical development of PEC T batinase uh, or PEC CBS or OT58. Um, here are some disclosures. Uh, this research was supported by Orphan Technologies, which is now a wholly owned subsidiary of Travel Therapeutics. And, uh, and I work as a consultant for both companies. And uh, our inventor, um, I'm an inventor on patents uh, uh, referred to in this presentation. Uh, as you probably know, um, CBS deficient homocysteine or CBSDH or HCU for uh, abbreviated uh, uh, is the most common uh, in inherited metabolic disorder of sulfur amino acid metabolism. It is autosomal recessive disorder, chiefly caused by the missense mutations in CBS gene. Uh, it is a rare disease uh, with worldwide prevalence uh, around 1 to 1,000, uh, but there is uh, certain effects of uh, so-called founders and ethnic mutations for uh, certain ethnicities or certain regions like R336C in Middle East uh, or G307S uh, in Irish descent or T191M in Spanish descent. Uh, it manifests, clinically, the disease manifests in four uh, systems like ocular, skeletal, and connective tissue, uh, vascular and uh, central nervous system with a um, specific set of um, symptoms, like you can see from these uh, pictures. Um, uh, biochemically, uh, it, character it is characterized by uh, uh, highly elevated uh, uh, levels of um, homocysteine, which accumulates because there is a block of uh, block in uh, CBS. CBS doesn't, doesn't work, so cannot remove homocysteine from this uh, methionine cycle. And that's the reason why homocysteine accumulates and all the other metabolites upstream, like uh, S-adenosyl homocysteine accumulates and also methionine accumulates uh, in homocysteinuria. And then there is a leg of cystatinin and um, uh, cystatinin, all the downstream products. Uh, current, therapy, current, current therapeutic options are very limited and mostly um, uh, relies on uh, protein and methionine restriction, so patients uh, cannot really uh, take any high protein foods like uh, meat, fish, cheese, or anything on, on that, and are um, uh, on uh, prescribed low protein, protein food diet, uh, often um, supplemented with um, various uh, methionine free formulas like this. Uh, additionally, uh, some patients which um, uh, are trying to uh, lower the homocysteine levels uh, further. Uh, they are pescabitine, which uh, helps uh, lowering homocysteine levels, but uh, on the flip side, uh, it builds up a methionine, as you can see uh, from this uh, scheme here. Uh, betaine helps convert homocysteine back to methionine, but so basically the sulfur stays in the cycle, uh, and it's like a vicious cycle of accumulating uh, methionine and uh, degrading homocysteine. Uh, so not really a solution. And then um, there is also uh, many patients, like uh, roughly 40% of patients, which show response to uh, B vitamin therapy, mostly B6, because B6 is the precursor of pyridoxal phosphate, which is a cofactor of CBS, a catalytic cofactor of CBS, and that uh, stimulates uh, residual activity of certain CBS neutrons, but not all of them. Uh, so clearly there was a there is an unmet need for uh, Novel therapeutic options, and one of those is uh, enzyme therapy or enzyme reduction therapy. Um, so, we hypothesize that um, since uh, 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 increased production of homocysteine and uh, its accumulation in plasma and, uh, and bodily fluid and tissues is a biochemical hallmark of uh, homocysteinuria, uh, and all current therapies are focusing on decrease or normalization of plasma uh, homocysteine. Uh, uh, we will introduce the um, uh, our enzyme therapy or enzyme treatment therapy into a bloodstream uh, where we um, uh, take care of homocysteine, and in that way uh, we will create a sink. So basically, like a uh, cells uh, accumulate homocysteine, which is uh, this uh, green star, uh, and dump it into a circulation in the plasma, uh, which is supposed to be cleared by kidney, 
that it's over the, the whole system is overwhelmed, overwhelmed but then we introduce uh, enzyme therapy into bloodstream uh, which can take care of or, or degrade homocysteine so we will degrade homocysteine in the bloodstream and that will create a concentration gradient uh, for the cells so cells can dump more and more uh, homocysteine to bloodstream where it is degraded by enzyme therapy and the whole uh, system comes into a balance and restores metabolic balance. So that was our hypothesis. Uh, and um, we developed this enzyme therapy, uh, fake tibatinate or OT58, uh, based on uh, uh, human CBS uh, enzyme, basically the enzyme which is uh, missing or which function is missing in, uh, in uh, uh, homocysteine uh, patients. However, uh, full length uh, uh, CBS enzyme is very complicated, tetrameric. Uh, um, allosterically regulated enzyme. Uh, therefore, uh, we uh, remove the regulatory domain, this green uh, uh, circle. Uh, we remove the regulatory allosterically regulatory domain uh, and also uh, introduce an additional mutation, C15 as mutation, um, and we got a truncated uh, enzyme, which is uh, much better expressed. Uh, has much higher activity and doesn't uh, require uh, allosteric activation by s uh, to achieve full potential. Uh, however, uh, when we injected this enzyme, enzyme to a homocysteine mice, it showed very, um, it showed very um, a short half-life in vivo, and we didn't see, uh, when we injected uh, the enzyme once daily, or once every day for a period of five days, we didn't see any effect on uh, homocysteine levels, and that was because uh, half-life of uh, this truncated enzyme in bloodstream was only 2.7 hours, and therefore we measuring every 24 hours, we couldn't see any, any efficacy. Therefore, uh, we decided to modify and increase, uh, well, one way to increase the half-life of uh, therapeutics, uh, biologics in, uh, in bloodstream is uh, regulation. And um, uh, we uh, ended up uh, modifying our truncated enzyme with uh, 20 colloid on NHS activated uh, polyethylene glycol, um, like you can see here. So basically, it's uh, covered in polyethylene glycol or PEG chains. Uh, and this enzyme, when injected uh, in the same fashion as the previous experiment, uh, once daily for a period of five days, uh, is so nice. Um, uh, significant uh, and substantial drop in homocysteine levels accompanied by uh, in, uh, increase in cystatin levels because cystatin is a product of uh, CBS. It takes homocysteine and, and, and um, serine to, to create cystatin in our water. So uh, we saw a very nice efficacy. So encouraged with these results, uh, we continue further into uh, additional uh, in vivo studies and one of the First, we did was um, uh, to use a KO or, or CBS knockout mouse model, which is um, neonatally lethal, and these mice doesn't survive, as you can see here. Uh, so when mice, uh, this black line, when mice are born and there is no treatment, so basically PBS uh, injected uh, subcutaneously, these mice, uh, by the end of uh, 30 days after weaning, after uh, they, they were born, uh, so they were actually no mice, all of them died. However, uh, those um, mice which were injected from day two, uh, uh, three times a week, uh, subcutaneously with uh, a milligram per kilo of um, fake tibatinase or uh, OT58. Uh, so these, uh, these mice, uh, more than uh, 85 uh, or more than 90% of these mice survived. And then we look at the uh, liver section because it was hypothesized that these mice died uh, previously when this model was um, discovered. So uh, uh, it was hypothesized that uh, these mice died from liver failure. And you can see here clearly that uh, liver of uh, KO mice is uh, uh, very uh, deranged. I mean, a lot of uh, uh, fat vesicles in here. Uh, signs of necrosis, and um, you can see here this red color that's all uh, fat deposition in, uh, inside the cells or outside the cells. Um, but um, uh, for the uh, for liver section of um, like mic light microscopy and electron microscopy of uh, those treated ones in the middle are basically indistinguishable from those of controls uh, which are on the right.
so pectiblatinase, we can conclude that pectiblatinase or OT58 preventive severe liver disease uh, rescued, uh, and rescued treated KO mice from premature death uh, due to liver failure. So that was a very great result. Uh, that was the first time these uh, KO mice were uh, actually rescue, rescued and survived into adulthood. Uh, but we were also interested whether this, uh, uh, whether our SING hypothesis, um, hypothesis uh, works. So uh, we look at the uh, homocysteine, methylene, all other sulfuric acid uh, metabolites levels in plasma and also in selective tissues. Uh, like you can see here, liver, kidney, and brain. And in this wild type, uh, untreated KO mice and uh, treated KO mice. And you can see here that um, uh, when we were able to decrease uh, substantially but not fully normalize homocysteine levels in uh, plasma uh, of KO mice with the, with the treatment, but uh, essentially we were able to normalize it in uh, liver, in kidney, and in brain uh, compared to untreated control. Uh, and compared to, I mean, uh, yeah, untreated control. Um, uh, and the same thing uh, can be said uh, for methylene, which is even more striking result, uh, where the methylene is uh, uh, usually elevated in, the, in these 18 days old KO mice, uh, but in, uh, uh, in plasma, liver, kidney, and brain, uh, but in treated, treated mice, uh, uh, it was fully normalized. So we can uh, conclude that uh, our SING hypothesis is valid and pectiblatinase uh, or multiplicate works uh, as anticipated. Um, later, we uh, moved uh, towards uh, looking at the other symptoms of, uh, of, uh, of, clinical, of clinical importance um, uh, in homocysteine mice. And one of those is uh, I to 70, 80 mouse, which has uh, multiple phenotype, uh, which can be easily fo followed. One of those is um, facial alopecia. As you can see here, this, this is I to 70, 80 mouse, uh, homocystinuric mouse, which uh, shows facial alopecia. This is water type control, and this is the mouse which has been treated um, before the onset of facial alopecia around 100 days of, uh, of, uh, of age. Uh, when the treatment was initiated before, so this mouse and maintained. So this mouse uh, is indistinguishable, uh, has indistingu indistinguishable hair from uh, from wild type controls. Uh, same can be said um, for um, ocular. So this is the section of uh, uh, of zonule, and these red uh, uh, red spikes, those are zonular zonul fibers. Um, as you can see in I two seventy eight mouse, these zonular fibers uh, which hold the lens in place. Uh, uh, so these zonal fibers are uh, very scarce, thin, and sometimes even broken. So this is not artificial, but this is the real um, area where the fibers are broken. Uh, but in those mice which have been treated from um, day two when they were born, um, uh, so in these mice the zonal fibers are in place, intact, uh, thick, and um, uh, very nicely hold the lens in place. Uh, another uh, feature of homocysteine I shared between uh, mice and, and, and human patients is that uh, uh, mice uh, show um, a low um, uh, bone mineralization and low uh, body fat content. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, OT58 effective latinase was able to restore uh, total mass or restore I an mean, improved total mass but restore uh, bone mineralization completely uh, to the level of control and improve uh, fat content in uh, in I2, 7, and 8 mice. And all these benefits were achieved without any methylene restrictions, so basically on a normal diet, normal methylene intake. Uh, all the benefits that I showed so far. Uh, but uh, we were also interested in uh, in uh, how the OT58 or pectiblatinase would uh, interact with the current treatments such as diet and betaine, and we uh, devised and performed two, two studies. Uh, one is long-term study, where we ask uh, for the question how it would interact with the met restriction, methane restriction, methane supplementation, and it is a non-dietary compliance, and it's quite good. So OT50 effectivatinase was able to maintain the levels uh, of homocysteine uh, during the whole study, 
over here uh, with or without beta in, and even during the uh, during the uh, switching of between high and low methionine diet and uh, standard methionine intake. And in a long in a short term study, uh, we were also interested in the question whether um, uh, there is a possible normal, uh, normal uh, normalization of homocysteine achievable. And uh, it is, as you can see here, but only when, the, when there is some kind of, uh, or some, kind, uh, some level of uh, methanol restriction. So basically 50% of methanol restriction compared to normal levels of methanol intake uh, would be sufficient to achieve full normalization of homocysteine levels in treated mice. Uh, so we can conclude that effective body and OT58 Restores metabolic balance uh, has the potential uh, to act as a salt treatment for homocysteinuria, can improve uh, clinical outcome and quality of life, of, uh, can potentially improve clinical outcome and quality of life of uh, homocysteinuria patients. And it is a investigation therapy which is in the, currently in the first in human clinical trial. And I would like to thank uh, all these people involved in this project from University of Colorado, Orphan Technologies, Charles University, Washington University, and and Institute of Metabolic Disease from Baylor. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, we've got several questions in the chat and in the Q&A, so we'll start um, with the chat. Um, can you comment on the differences between your mice and those of Warren Kruger? Um, and can you possibly rescue your mice with lumothionine? Uh, so basically, we use the same mice. Uh, those, uh, like I showed uh, in my slides, uh, with fac facial alopecia and bone mineral density, and uh, with uh, ocular phenotype. So those were the exact the same mice we, we got them from Warren Kruger. But uh, that uh, phenotype I showed on the liver and survival, those are uh, CBS scale mice. And uh, uh, the efficacy was, um, was great in, in both of these mice. And we also use HO mice. Uh, uh, which doesn't really show a lot of phenotype, but they have biochemical um, disbalance. And uh, this pectibatinase was able to correct this biochemical disbalance in these mice as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, additionally, could this ERT therapy be useful in other forms of HCU? Uh, potentially, yes. Uh, so basically this um, pectibatinase uh, can be used Essentially, in any condition where almost uh, elevated homocysteine is a problem, uh, it remains to be seen uh, whether it can affect or uh, improve any other um, uh, symptoms uh, associated with the other uh, forms of homocysteinuria. But definitely, it can improve homocysteine levels, uh, or at least uh, we haven't tried, but uh, with these mouse models uh, or in patients, but. Uh, uh, you know, we don't know uh, whether it can improve all the other symptoms. Uh, and Dr. Cedarbaum asks, is there any risk of lowering homocysteine levels excessively? Remethylation to methionine may be important for one carbon donation um, when there is no protein intake. Uh, we didn't see anything uh, like that because uh, we used a uh, uh, normal methionine intake for most of our experiments and we were not able to normalize. We were able to decrease substantially to levels uh, acceptable by the guidelines, so definitely below 100 or def uh, below 80, but not to normal, which is 10 to 15, let's say, micromolar. And um, uh, I don't think there will be any issue with that. Uh, okay. Um, additionally, in the 1278T model, if methionine is not abnormal in that mouse model later, does it matter that there were beneficial effects without methionine restriction? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Um, we've got a few others in the chat. Can you comment on the immune aspects, anti-drug antibodies, anti-PEG antibodies, uh, expected frequency of administration of dosing? So the dosing we used to mostly is subcutaneous dosing. Um, in mice, uh, we measured the uh, and we, uh, we measured half-life of the pectibatinase in in mice, in uh, rats, and in monkeys. And we estimated that in, in humans it would be like a one-week uh, half-life. 
Um, so um, fre frequency of dosing in mice, it was reused uh, three times a week, but in humans, it can be potentially once a week or once in two weeks. Um, and what was what were the others? Uh, um, immune those? Res sorry, immune responses. Oh, immune, immune response. yeah. Uh, so when we measured uh, uh, um, like a immunogenic response in, in mice, we didn't see any like a, uh, immune reactions. Uh, um, but mice are not very good predictors of, uh, of immune response in, uh, compared to human, in, uh, what, what we see in humans. Uh, in rats, when we did the experiments in, in these three uh, different species, like mice, rats, and in monkeys, uh, so in rats, we saw some substantial or, or lack of lack of accumulation of uh, CBS activity in bloodstream. So that may suggest that there was a, like a significant immune response to, to to the enzyme. But we saw it only in in rats uh, and nowhere else. Not not in monkeys. Not in mice. So, so it remains to be it. seen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and and go on to Professor McLean. So Dr. Ken McLean is a yeah. professor of pediatrics and clinical genetics and metabolism, again, at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Um, and his talk today uh, is on how elucidating regulatory crosstalk between folate and thiol metabolism can lead to improved treatment in classical homocystinuria, a possible route to the end of methionine restriction. And handing it over to Professor McLean. Yeah, no, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. And as of now, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. I hope to do something about that. Okay, so I am very interested in current treatments for homocysteine. I'm largely focused on the severest form of the disease, the pyridoxine non-responsive. And treatment for that form of the disease is a methionine-restricted diet and betaine, which is basically serves as a methyl donor for the remethylation of homocysteine to methionine, catalyzed by the liver enzyme betaine homocysteine methyl transferase. Okay. Um, I, oh, actually, I'm not sure it's the right place. There's a real problem with the methionine restriction of the diet. It's extremely hard to, to stick to. And we are very interested in thinking, can we improve the efficacy of betaine treatment such that uh, the patients might be able to relax their uh, use of the re uh, protein restricted diet and that would be basically a significant improvement in patient outcome and quality of life okay i'm going to go back to this slide i got this slide originally from michael lever in new zealand and i would like to draw your attention to dimethylglycine and dimethylglycine is an allosteric inhibitor of the BHMT enzyme. It binds to it and lowers its um, efficacy. So the removal of dimethylglycine is a critical choke point in the betaine uh, pathway. So, and it's something that's not really been looked at very much in the context of betaine treatment of homocystinuria. Okay. To do this, you need an animal model and um, it's, you know, you can't just do this in humans. You actually have to have an animal model. And my lab has done a lot of characterization of the HO mouse model. It has a hypercoactive phenotype. It responds biochemically and phenotypically to betaine treatment. Uh, it shows impaired learning and memory that also responds to treatment. It has osteoporosis, constitutive expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, altered apoliprotein expression, and significantly altered sulfur metabolism. So, when it's investigated in isolation from methionine restriction in our homocystinuric mice, we have previously reported the betaine efficacy goes down over time. And that's a problem. Uh, I don't think it was really uh, appreciated before. And we were starting to think, okay, is, that, is there a mechanism for that? Why is that happening? Because the protein levels were the same. It just seemed to be the efficacy of the protein itself. And we started thinking about remethylation disorders due to cobalamin deficiencies. And there, betaine, according to a my collaborator, Sally Stabler, betaine treatment works very, very poorly in those forms of deficiency. And in, the, in methionine synthase deficiency and disorders of cobalamin transport and metabolism, you get a thing called a methylfolate trap, which acts to diminish supply of tetrahydrofolate, which is a crucial factor in processing dimethylglycine. If you look at this uh, map here, you'll see MTHFR and uh, MTR in the folate cycle. And if MTR is impaired, 
5-methyltetrahydrofolate gets trapped in that form. It can't be reversed and it just stays that way. But if you look into the mitochondria on the right hand side, you'll see that the dimethylglycine dehydrogenase step and the two steps below, all three of those have an obligate requirement for tetrahydrofolate. So that might be an explanation. So despite the crucial role of tetrahydrofolate in the remethylation of homocysteine, the impact of homocysteinuria upon classical homocysteinuria upon one carbon metabolism is largely uninvestigated. We want to do something about that. We did a fairly comprehensive analysis of uh, one car of uh, the methionine cycle and the folate cycle, and we published it this year. And one of the things that jumped out at us was the fact there's an imbalance between uh, methionine synthase and MTHFR, which, uh, where as you can see, the latter enzyme is induced to fold in homocysteinuria. And we thought, well, okay, that has the ability, that has the potential to cause an accumulation of 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate. And when we looked at our metabolomics data, we found that, yeah, there's a tenfold uh, increase in the, in the hepatic levels of 5-methyltetrahydrofolate. This is important because 5-methyltetrahydrofolate is somewhat unusual. Folates within cells are normally ligated to chains of glutamate molecules, and this process actually anchors the folates within the tissues. But 5-methyltetrahydrofolate is a very poor substrate for glutamate ligation. Consequently, a lot of the 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate gets transported out of tissues into the blood, and from there, a portion of that out into the urine. So, by sequestering more of cellular folate in 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate form, homocysteinuria could lead to significant depletion of folates. And that has the potential to have a knock on effect on the efficacy of BTEC treatment. This also explains a number of previous observations in some papers from the 60s. There's a paper by Carey, Fennelly, and Fitzgerald who showed that uh, there was in classical homocysteinurics, there's subnormal serum folate levels and increased folate clearance, which is consistent with what we've seen so far. So we decided we would have a look at uh, those enzymes that generate tetrahydrofolate within uh, the liver. And a critical, the main determinant of that is an enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase. And that basically takes dietary dihydrofolate and converts them to tetrahydrofolate. And we found when we looked that it's significantly repressed in homocysteinuric mouse livers. And that problem is not really changed that much by VTEC treatment. So we also looked at 10 formal tetrahydrofolate dehydrogenase, which is quite a mouthful. So it would be ALDH1L1 from now on, which is also kind of a mouthful. And that is another THF generating enzyme, and it is about 50% repressed in our homocysteric animal livers. And yeah, as we, uh, the business end, the tetrahydrofolate levels within the mitochondria are particularly crucial for the butane reaction. So we decided to look at, um, there is a, um, what's it called? So there's a mitochondrial form of the enzyme, uh, ALDH1L2. And we looked at the expression levels of that in our homocysteric mice compared to wild type controls. And the repression is even more severe. As you can see, it's not remotely subtle. It is strongly repressed. And then we're going to have a look at another enzyme that generates tetrahydrofolate, which is GART, which plays a crucial role in de novo purine biosynthesis. And as you can see from the left-hand side, that is also it's variable, but it's significantly repressed. So collectively, when we looked at all these four major determinants of tetrahydrofolate level, we felt we were fairly strong, on fairly strong ground to say that uh, homocysteinuria, classical homocysteinuria, acts to limit the hepatic availability of tetrahydrofolate which has the potential to impair the ability of betaine to lower homocysteine. So we pose the question, if tetrahydrofolate is limiting, how does that affect the expression of the tetrahydrofolate dependent enzyme, dimethylglycine dehydrogenase, which regulates the efficacy of the betaine response? And what we found when we looked is we realized it's uh, fairly strongly repressed. It's about 50% of wild type levels in our homocysteinuric mice. So if we limit tetrahydrofolate su supply even further to test the hypothesis that the expression level of that enzyme is sensitive to the intracellular levels of tetrahydrofolate, what happens if we give them the DHFR inhibitor drug, methotrexate, which is a fairly common chemotherapeutic that inhibits DHFR? What happens to dimethylglycine dehydrogenase expression in homocysteinuric mice treated with that compound? And what you see is already low levels of dimethylglycine dehydrogenase are further repressed. And that's about maybe 20%, 15% of the wild type level. 
So we thought that's actually quite good. We think, okay, that enzyme is regu does appear to be regulated by tetrahydrofolate levels. So we thought, well, what if, how can we reverse this? How can we boost the tetrahydrofolate levels? And the first thing we tried was folinic acid, which are uh, 5 4 mile tetrahydrofolate. And it's readily converted to folic acid derivatives, but it crucially in a manner that bypasses dihydrofolate reductase. So when we treated the mice with uh, folinic acid, we got a fair, highly variable response, but no statistically uh, significant lowering of homocysteine. And we also got a significant accumulation of the BHMT inhibitor compound dimethylglycine, which just goes to show you that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And because I'm a fan of Sean and Margaret Brosnan's work, I've always been interested in, the, in their work on formates. And uh, formic acid and its conjugate base form formate are the only non tetrahydrofolate linked intermediates in one carbon metabolism and serves as a donor of one carbon groups to the intracellular tetrahydrofolate pool. So we are posed the question could formate act to lower to homocysteine in uh, classical homocysteine by serving as a gradual release source of tetrahydrofolate? The first thing we looked at was there's a number of amino acids, and this this figure comes from one of Sean's papers. We looked at uh, serine, glycine, and sarcosine, and then tryptophan and histidine, and used them as supplements, knowing that their excess can actually be converted to formate. And I'll show you the glycine and the serine, but all of those amino acids, except for tryptophan, were able to significantly lower the homocysteine in our mice. Uh, glycine by about 50%, serine by about 60, which is good, but it's not enough. That's still too high. But when we combine them with betaine, it appears that these amino acids will not cooperate with betaine. There's no further lowering. In fact, they seem to actually inhibit the BHMT function. So then we asked, what if we give sodium formate directly in drinking water? And this is, if you come away with nothing else, this is the thing you should uh, take away from this talk. When we gave them formate, we saw a roughly 50% decrease in plasma homocysteine. When we combined it with uh, betaine, we got near normal levels of homocysteine, down to about 20 micromolar. But I should stress that's in the presence of a formethionine diet, which has never really been seen before. If you, any of you, if any medics are watching and you have a patient that comes in with 20 micromolar homocysteine, you know they're pretty much safe. But if they then told you that they were eating a formethionine diet, you'd probably say they were lying. So this is actually quite a significant finding. So, because we're scientists, uh, which means poor social skills and bad choices in clothing, we feel the need to know how it works. And so we had to look at the mechanism. And we asked the question, how does formate act to lower homocysteine and homocysteine in mice? And obviously, because we were interested in the link between tetrahydrofolate and um, dimethylglycine dehydrogenase expression, we were going to look at some members of that pathway. The first thing we looked at was BHMT, and there is no induction of BHMT by formate. And what you see there for the combined treatment is pretty much the same as you would see with BTN alone. But three preliminary lines of evidence indicate that formate is acting to lower homocysteine and homocysteine advice by improving the function of the BHMT mediated pathway, the pathway itself, not by, uh, by BHMT, but by the actual pathway. First of all, we noticed that formate treatment restores normal levels of dimethylglycine dehydrogenase expression in uh, homocysteine in mice, and that has the potential to augment the betaine response. Secondly, uh, the slide in the middle shows the original CBS null mouse does that developed by Naboro Maeda, and that mouse has, we showed in 2010, that mouse has terrible liver problems, and those few mice that survive, they, um, they don't have a functional betaine response. So the BHMT doesn't work in the livers of those mice. So when we give those mice either formate, serine, or glycine, we don't see any lowering of the homocysteine. And finally, if we treat the homocysteine mice with a BHMT specific inhibitor, formate treatment no longer lowers homocysteine in HO mice. So we think we're on fairly strong ground there. Okay, so a cautionary note, this isn't propaganda. Uh, in, uh, the, the actual enzymes, dimethylglycine dehydrogenase and sarcosine dehydrogenase, they do generate formaldehyde as a byproduct. Obviously, formaldehyde is genotoxic. We don't want to cure homocysteine and give people cancer, so we have to pay attention to this. Formaldehyde is detoxified in mammals by the formaldehyde dehydrogenase ADH5 in the cytoplasm and by ADH2 in the mitochondria. 
and high levels of formate treatment did induce expression of ADH5. Although that doesn't mean formaldehyde is accumulating, we still have to work on this. It may well be that it's being detoxified. And we saw a similar pattern with the uh, mitochondrial enzyme as well. Uh, but when we use lower concentrations of formate, we can still significantly lower homocysteine without inducing ADH5. So it doesn't preclude it, it just means we have to pay attention to it. So for safety reasons, we think a gradual release formulation of formate may be preferable. The formate can be con conjugated to glycerol and gradually released in the gut by the action of enteric lipases. Uh, Triformin is the triester of glycerol and formate and it is commercially available. In three preliminary independent experiments, we have found that triformin treatment can lower plasma total homocysteine by approximately 60%. So obviously those experiments and other formate donors are still going on in our laboratory. So in conclusion, it's very clear that one carbon metabolism is significantly dysregulated in classical homocysteine and we are continuing our investigations in this area. There's still quite a few more enzymes to work on. This dysregulation so far clearly has the potential to limit the betaine response by decreasing the pool of tetrahydrofolate available for the removal of dimethylglycine. Formate donor amino acids serine, glycine, sarcosine, and histidine can significantly lower homocysteine levels in homocysteine mice, but they impair further lowering of homocysteine when combined with betaine. Treatment of homocysteine mice with formate effectively halves homocysteine levels and when it's combined with betaine, can achieve near normal levels of homocysteine in the presence of a formethionine diet. The gradual release formulation of formate in combination with betaine has the potential to serve as a significantly improved treatment for homocysteine. Okay, so these are where we got the funding from. I'm very grateful to the William R. Hummel Homocysteine Research Fund, which is um, you know, an amalgamation of the efforts of the East, Hummel and Kaufman families. Thank you very much. We also got significant support from HCU America, and uh, thank you Margie McGlynn and HCU Australia. Thank you Tara Morrison. And finally, these are the people in my lab that worked on this. Uh, Pai Zhang, John Austin, and Eugene Kim. I am forever grateful to the giant brain that resides within Sally Stabler for her intellectual input, and Johan van Hove. And obviously we're very grateful to uh, some very useful discussions from Sean and Margaret Brosnan. And thank you so much for another excellent talk. So, uh, Ken, the first question coming to you comes from Dr. Kruger. Uh, the combination data of the formate plus betaine is impressive. Is it possible that it is working by increasing expression of the CBS transgene? It's a good question. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. It's a good question and we have looked at it and it doesn't change. Great. Okay, uh, and then Dr. Sloan was wondering if you've looked at the B12 pathway, are any of these enzymes dysregulated in the HCU mice? Okay, a common theme here seems to be very good questions. Uh, we are actively looking at that because I think, I think we actually have to look at this as a fresh canvas. We have to look at virtually every gene that is uh, involved in this process and, and ask ourselves, is it likely to be um, altered by uh, homocysteinuria. Dihydrofolate reductase was a real surprise to us. There's nothing in the literature to suggest a crosstalk between thiol metabolism and that. But when we deplete glutathione using BSO and DEM, we do actually see a repression of dihydrofolate reductase. So it's an example of one of these things where although we're laser focused on homocysteinuria, this may actually have a lot of a useful information for people that are using dihydrofolate reductase for chemothe uh, chemotherapy, things like that. There may be a way to accentuate its, um, its efficacy by actually having a better understanding of how it's regulated. And Dr. Venditti is actually asking, is this transcriptional in its regulation or an alternative regulatory stream? We've only looked at the protein level. Actually, no, I take that back because in our mi <laughs> microarrays, that makes me sound very dated. I know it's all RNA-seq now, but in our microarrays, we didn't see any change in the dihydrofolate reductase. So that was, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it is probably post-transcriptional. Okay. And can you comment at all on the phenotype of your treated mice with respect to uh, beyond the biomarker data? You commented on the phenotype without treatment. What do they do with treatment? Um, we've only done looked at those phenotypic markers in when we've used betaine treatment and, and also taurine treatment. This is, we still have a lot, um, a lot of preclinical work to do on this. And that is, I've just, just submitted an R01, looking to look at all those phenotypic markers 
to uh, see how that would go with Forme. But I would like to, I would speculate that 20 micromolar homocysteine is highly likely to, uh, to improve things. I should, uh, I realize from um, Warren's talk and from Tom's talk, I said I had no, um, what's it called? No conflict of interest, but I do have intellectual property on this and we are talking to uh, uh, companies, but we haven't actually got signed anything. So I neglected to put that down as a conflict of interest. So full disclosure. Well, you've managed to find one after all. Congratulations. <laughs> all righty. Um, and uh, moving on now, we'll um, head over to Dr. Roth, since we have no other questions in the Q&A. Um, Dr. Fritz Roth is coming to us um, as a full professor in the Donnelly Center for Cellular and Molecular Research at the University of Toronto. And his talk today is on testing all possible amino acid changes in the homocystinuria protein CBS and MTHFR. I know we all look forward to hearing um, how much extra work that's going to give some of us clinical geneticists in the, in the coming days. So uh, go ahead, take it away, Fritz. Thank you. Hi, my name is Fritz Roth. Thanks for the invitation and uh, readings from my kitchen in Toronto. I'm going to talk today about testing all possible amino acid changes in the protein CBS and MTHFR. So uh, the context for this, of course, is the um, clinical variant interpretation crisis that we're sequencing lots more gene panels and, and increasingly exomes and genomes, and we're finding lots of pathogenic variants, but we're finding variants of uncertain significance even faster. Uh, so each of us carries 100 to 400 rare missense variants, and uh, most of those, of course, aren't clinically interpreted. Um, but when they are, uh, the majority are now called variants of uncertain or unknown significance, VUSs. And so what we'd like to maybe get away from is this reactive mode of uh, functional testing, where uh, we have a phenotype that uh, suggests uh, clinical genomes, uh, clinical uh, genetic testing. And then when we find a variant that's novel, uh, typically we don't have functional evidence to help our clinical interpretation. And those clinical interpretations end up mostly being the US's. Uh, sometimes months or years later, a research lab may do a functional assay on a variant. So the next person to come along with that variant after the assay is done, uh, is likely to get a better clinical interpretation. The jury's still out on how much better, but I've heard some people say uh, that 50% uh, of the VUS can be reclassified. This has worked from Leah Starita and Brian Schertz in Seattle um, that they've talked about um, uh, pre-publication. So uh, one strategy to think about is that we, for every amino acid substitution at every amino acid position, we do the functional assay ahead of time, even before we've ever seen a variant in the clinic at that position. And with that in hand, we can think about proactive uh, variant interpretation, pro proactive functional testing that allows better clinical interpretation because when the novel variant is first seen in the clinic, uh, we've already done the assay and it can help, um, and th those results can help interpret the variant. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this variant effect mapping idea talk about uh, results for CBS and for MTHFR, and then give a little bit of outlook and uh, talk about the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance. Okay, so shout out to the pioneers. My lab did not invent deep mutational scanning. We've developed some methods to go with it and put our stamp on it maybe, but the pioneers uh, were Stan Fields' lab um, from, uh, from which uh, Doug Fowler emerged and we're collaborating with both Doug and Stan um, and uh, with Leah Starita and Jay Shandur, um, who are really pioneers in this area. And, uh, and so I guess in my lab, we've focused uh, mainly on uh, functional complementation assays. That's been our focus. Uh, some of the earlier deep mutational scanning work used sort of sub-functional assays like stability or interaction of a protein. Um, we've tried to get a sort of a more holistic functional uh, measure of a protein. And so the basic idea, and this is a, a, the strategy for yeast, which um, will be what I talk most about today. Um, and the idea is that you have a, a yeast human orthology relationship, um, where when you knock out the yeast gene, you get a phenotype that can be rescued. Not only um, is there an ortholog, but it's, a, it's an ortholog that is actually able to rescue 
Um, and if the and this works about a third to half of the time uh, when there is a, a one to one orthology relationship between human and yeast. Um, so it doesn't always work, but when it does work, when the human gene is able to rescue the yeast phenotype, now you have an assay for variation. So now you can try to rescue with the variant clone. And if it still rescues, your best guess is that um, this is a tolerated variant. And if your best guess is, uh, if it no longer rescues, then your best guess is that it's a dysfunctional variant. Okay, so the overall scheme for variant effect mapping is mutagenesis, and that could be noisy PCR, um, which gets you the single nucleotide variants most likely to be seen in the clinic. But actually, uh, the economies of scale are such that it's not much more expensive to do full codon mutagenesis, and we order one oligo per codon with a three-base degeneracy at that codon, so that, uh, and we tune the oligo concentration so that there's on average one hybridization event per clone. And so what that gets us is a random replacement with a random codon at a random position. So we make a library um, that attempts to saturate all of the codon substitutions in one um, expression library. We do use the gateway system for aficionados of this, but uh, that makes it easy to make the library and then move the library either into a yeast expression vector, <coughs> excuse me, or a, a human integration vector. And in this case, I'll be talking about yeast expression vectors today. But the idea is you do a little lab experiment, a little lab evolution experiment, where uh, basic, basically every cell is carrying a different variant. And we're at a yeast strain that is rigged for dependence on the human gene, so that if the variant doesn't serve to complement the loss of the uh, yeast gene, then uh, the variant will drop out over the course of this lab evolution experiment. And the readout is um, to take short, roughly 150 nucleotide tiles in this um, cDNA body, in this code, uh, coding region, and go about two or three million reads deep by Illumina and count how often you see each missense variant before the selection and after the selection. And by comparing those uh, frequencies of, of, uh, of, of each variant before and after the selection, we can come up with a map. And in some cases, there are gray spots in this map. So blue is bad and white is neutral. Yellow is the wild type, um, uh, uh, white wild type amino acid. And occasionally, there are gray spots where the variant wasn't sufficiently represented at the beginning of the selection for us to really um, say that this was measured at all. And we can do some imputation and regularization to fill in a few of those gray spots, not always, but if there's uh, sufficient data at that position, we can fill it in. Reviewers hate that, so typically we report these now and then put this in the supplement. But actually, the, the accuracy of these imputations can be as good as the experimental data, because actually it's mostly based on experimental data of other variants at the same position. Okay, so my lab has made uh, maps for 13 proteins, and uh, we're working on more. Uh, I'm going to talk about CVS and MTHFR today. And, uh, and so here's the list of projects where we've completed maps um, and, the, and the diseases associated with those, um, with those genes. So CBS, MTHFR, homocysteinuria. But if there are other genes on this list that are interesting to you, um, I, I always love to collaborate. And so please let me know. OK, so uh, the basic variant effect map gets you, uh, you know, a mapping, if you will, from variants to variant effects. But uh, this is the first map I'll, I'll talk about, the first set of maps I'll talk about, um, actually ask the question, how does that landscape of uh, effects of variation change depending on environment? So this is our first kind of foray into the idea of using variant effect mapping to model not only gene, but gene by environment um, relationships. OK, so uh, CBS, cystothionine beta synthase. Um, you guys probably all know more about this enzyme than I do. Um, all the speakers who came before me, and hopefully somebody who came before me um, said something about the biochemistry. But this is the one carbon metabolism pathway. And CBS sits here. And if uh, there's a defect in CBS, you get a buildup in homocysteine. OK, you guys all know that. Um, and I'll come back to talk about MTHFR. So a little history that you guys also probably know better than I do, um, but from discovery in 62 to uh, recognizing it as an enzyme defect um, and pretty rapidly to uh, recognizing that some patients could benefit from vitamin B6 therapy. 
Um, I, I, I'm mostly showing this slide so I can give a shout out to Victor Kosich, who's been a great collaborator who described the first um, mutations. And, uh, and I, I'm indebted to Warren Kruger, who's I've never met, but he's spoken before me at this meeting, and I hope to meet him someday. But I'm indebted uh, to him for coming up with the yeast complementation assay that we're using, and to Jasper Ryan, who's employed a yeast complementation assay also, and gave a talk that inspired me to think about CPS. So the basic idea is to make this mutagenized library and uh, to uh, then grow that in um, selective uh, can the, the selective condition that you know, demands the function of yeast. And um, uh, this is, by the way, the, the ortholog is cis4 um, in yeast. That's uh, actually a temperature, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a knockout, which um, does not grow in the, in the uh, selective environment. And, uh, but in, in one of these, we used low vitamin B6 or no vitamin B6 um, and averaged the two results because they were about the same. And, uh, and in the other, we used high vitamin B6. And, um, and then from uh, the strategy I just described, we get scores. And, um, and there's another project that I'll, I'll allude to at the end, where we try to infer um, from the, the diploid genotype for each patient um, some sort of uh, CBS activity score. Uh, but to make a very long story very short, here are the maps for low vitamin B6, high vitamin B6, and then the delta between them. And you can see the maps are almost replicates if you sort of stand way back. Um, but this is the delta between them, and you can see that there are differences. Um, the, the diagonal here indicates error, so some of the differences um, are subject to high estimated error, and some are not, so I'll say more. I'll also say this is just a partial and terminal map because it's actually um, kind of hard to visualize the whole thing uh, uh, over its full length, but two maps and the delta over the full length of CBS, where we've attempted to measure um, every uh, amino acid substitution. And so here we've zoomed in on just one region, and, uh, and you can again, again see uh, a zoom up of this. So across all of the amino acid changes we measured, um, you can see the distribution of scores uh, for nonsense in red and, and for synonymous variants in green. And we've scaled the score from zero to one now so that zero is null-like and one is um, sort of wild-type-like. And here's the distribution of a sense variance, which you can see is kind of bimodal. So um, it either looks like uh, null or it looks um, like it came from the wild-type distribution and a few things middle, and it's about the same story for uh, the high vitamin B6 map. And if you look at delta scores for nonsense and synonymous, um, they're sort of centered on zero, as you might expect, and uh, symmetric for nonsense and synonymous. But for missense, there's an excess tail here um, of variants whose severity decreases when you um, add more vitamin B6. OK. Uh, so the first. Uh, Biggest, I guess, the most important take home here is that you, if you spread out the distribution um, for pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in blue and uh, and not annotated as pathogenic variants, um, many of uh, which are from the Nomad database, um, in pink here, you can see that there's a separation between them um, by our map scores in both the low and the high vitamin B6 maps. You can draw a precision versus recall curve here. So um, if we set a, a, there's of course a trade off of where you set your threshold and score, but depending on where you set your map score threshold, um, you can either get high precision, um, so a, a, a high probability of being correct when you make the prediction, um, but that comes at the cost of recall. Uh, so the higher your uh, precision, uh, the, the lower a fraction of pathogenic variants you can predict. And so the blue and black curves come from our maps, and um, the other three curves are computational methods, and we've tried others, uh, and the maps um, are not perfect. Um, but you can see that at high stringency, say 90% um, precision, we can get uh, to around 50% recall. We can catch about half of the pathogenic variants. And at that stringency, um, uh, the best of the methods we're showing here, um, and it's, it's about, uh, there, there isn't much better that we've looked at, um, gets only 20% of the pathogenic variants. So we're doing better than the computational methods, but still not perfect. 
Um, we're looking forward to collaborating with the EHAD Consortium. You've heard a talk earlier in the session from Dr. Humer. Uh, and uh, so they've collected a cohort, uh, EHAD has collected a cohort of CBS deficiency patients uh, that are genotyped. And, and so this is sort of a breakdown of alleles and there, um, as you might expect, um, uh, there are many missense variants um, that need to be examined. And so we're uh, keen uh, to think about those. And, and uh, this is sort of a breakdown internationally of where the patients are coming from. And importantly, there's a breakdown of um, non-responders all the way to extreme responders uh, in this cohort. And so we're interested in how the MAP scores uh, correlate not only with pathogenicity, um, but with responsiveness to vitamin B6 therapy. Okay, on to MTHFR. Um, so uh, I mentioned that we could look at how MAPs change um, in different environments, and we saw that for the vitamin B6 dependent CBS MAPs. And now we're going to do that and add a dimension of genetic background. Um, so it's sort of um, gene effects, um, gene by gene and um, gene by environment uh, effects. Um, and actually, I'll come back. There's actually gene by gene by environment here, but I won't say much about that. Anyway, here's MTHFR and the one carbon metabolism pathway. And, uh, and so, it, so some patients uh, respond to folic acid therapy, and um, in part that is because uh, of mass action. The, the more precursor you have, the more you can drive through the reaction, but there's sort of an interesting story that um, the concentration of precursor may actually um, affect uh, the ability of the enzyme to retain its cofactor FAD. Um, so in the absence of precursor, um, FAD binds MTHFR less tightly. So another sort of history slide um, from the early 70s uh, discovery to just uh, quickly uh, learning that some patients benefited from uh, folic uh, acid uh, or high, high uh, folinate diet. Um, Gene was cloned and another shout out to Warren Kruger for developing the yeast complementation assay and uh, to Jasper Ryan, who again inspired me to think about this. And also he developed uh, a version of the assay where you could control the intracellular um, folate uh, or folinate uh, more directly. Okay, uh, now here's the genotype background element. So many of you have heard of the A222B alanine 222 valine variant. And uh, I've heard people say that this is the variant most hated by clinical geneticists, not because it's bad, but because it means they have to sit down and talk with patients who had a prenatal um, uh, panel um, screening, and they might otherwise be able to say, uh, clean bill of health, uh, nothing to worry about, um, but then the 30% uh, um, uh, there's a 30% allele frequency for A22B, and half of us carry A22B, so they, um, for basically half of the people who get this screening, they have to tell them about this variant um, and uh, so 10% of us are homozygotes. Um, should we worry? Um, it is known that A22B has lower um, activity, and so it is a functional variant, and it is clear that there's a neural tube um, uh, defect risk um, in babies from homozygous uh, moms, um, but only if mom has had a low folate diet. So basically the standard advice if you're pregnant to, to get the high folate diet, if uh, you follow that, um, then A22B is not considered um, risky. And so, uh, and uh, some other associations are there, but, but are controversial. So I think the, the general um, idea is that, is that moms should not worry about it. They should just get their folate. Well, does it matter? I, I don't know. We were interested in exploring that further. And so what we did is um, four MTHFR variant effect maps at different folinate concentrations. Folinate is interchangeable with... Um, folic acid and with the tetrahydrofolate precursor. Um, and we did another four maps in the same folate concentrations, but now every clone, in addition to carrying each of the variants we're um, assessing here, also carries uh, the A222B variant in the same clone. So it's we're judging the effect of A222B um, and folate on every other variant. And you can see at a high level, these almost look like replicates. Uh, they aren't, if you zoom in, you can see there's a little stripe um, that is uh, visible at low folate um, and kind of goes away at high folate um, here. 
and I'll come back to that. So there are subtle differences that are worth thinking about. And so these eight maps together got us uh, maps of sort of baseline deleteriousness, full innate responsiveness, and um, A23B genetic interactions. And just as a reality check, indeed, the A22B variant um, it does show lower fitness in our assays, but um, especially so at the low uh, full innate concentration. So that makes sense. Um, but what's cool now is we can interpolate between these four maps and see how the landscape changes in different environments. So this is kind of cool. Um, and you can see there are some, uh, some changes happening here. Some of them, of course, um, again, the excuse me, the diagonal uh, indicates uh, estimated error, um, but some of these are clearly um, full innate dependent. Here's the most striking example, the stripe I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's actually a disordered loop and uh, didn't uh, have any uh, electron density uh, modeled in the crystal structure because it's um, disordered. And there's this tryptophan at the sort of ed end of the loop. And this is uh, not important at high um, full innate according to our maps, but seems very important at low folinate concentration. So what's going on there? Uh, I'm going to make another very long story short and just say, here's a model of uh, the active site with the um, folate related to the uh, precursor. And you can see that um, there's a pi stacking um, interaction between the cofactor and, and folate. And that might explain <clears throat> how FAD is retained better in the presence of the precursor. Um, that they're actually interacting directly. Interestingly, you can model this by molecular dynamics, which we've done with uh, Rini Maya and Michael Garten. Um, we've modeled this, and, and when the folate is, uh, precursor is gone, this loop seems to flip in and um, bind with the FAD cofactor and may help in retaining it uh, in the absence of, you know, in low folate conditions. And you can uh, modulate that to another uh, aromatic group, and there's still some binding, but if you change it to a non-aromatic group, uh, and by the way, those are the worst scores in our map, uh, is it for non-aromatic groups, um, if you change it to a non-aromatic group, it doesn't seem to hang out with FAD at all. Um, I guess the most important result here um, is uh, that we are doing uh, reasonably well in predicting pathogenic variants, again, like CPS. Here, all of the colored lines are different versions of our experimental map. So we can choose uh, one of the maps, or you know, the wild type background or the a 2 b background, or we can average uh, you know, at, at one particular concentration of folinate, or we can average over the wild type maps or the a 2 b maps, or we can aggregate over all maps. And kind of no matter how you slice it, we're generally doing better than the computational methods. And again, still not perfect. Um, but a, a big step forward. So we're getting, with the best of these um, analyses, we're getting to 70% uh, um, recall at 100% precision. So um, pretty good. And if you uh, switch, so this was the catalytic domain, and it's worth noting that we do worse for the regulatory domain. And so the best of the experimentally derived uh, maps is uh, getting to 50% precision at 100% recall. Uh, but uh, you know, you had to really, you know, you had to average over all of them, and individual maps did less well in that. Of course, the computational methods do worse than they did for the, the catalytic domain as well. Okay, so one of the lessons here is that um, variants in the A22B background tended to be um, tended to shift in their functional score at low folate levels. So. Uh, most variants were not particularly folinic acid responsive. There were some, um, but uh, in the a 2 b background, the number of variants that were folinic acid responsive uh, went way up. And so we thought that was pretty interesting. So maybe we shouldn't care about a 2 b except uh, if there's another variant um, uh, present. Uh, so uh, Outlook and Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance. So as time goes on, we're seeing more and more publications that are doing variant effect mapping. This is the most recent curated uh, data that we have on, on that um, sort of productivity in that field. And um, of the roughly 4,000 annotated human disease genes, uh, okay, maybe only 5 to 10% will have a yeast complementation assay, those um, orthologs in yeast. 
Um, but if you want a sort of a subfunctional assay, 40% of human of these uh, 4,000 disease uh, genes have an interaction reported uh, by these two hybrid assays. So maybe we could have a yeast based assay for stability and interaction. But maybe more interestingly is uh, 80% almost of uh, human disease associated genes show some phenotype on knockdown uh, by CRISPR in a human cell line. So that suggests that there may be human cell line models for a large fraction of human uh, disease genes. So these might be tractable for um, deep mutational scanning or variant effect mapping. And um, I'm very I'm proud to have co-founded the, uh, the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance with this shared vision of trying to put together a map um, for every, ultimately every human disease associated protein um, and for other uh, non-coding elements that are associated with um, function. And um, so we're trying to coordinate this effort um, in uh, sort of register um, interest and um, activity on projects and to assist with um, standards for judging technologies and for implementing technologies in a way that they're best, uh, most useful for clinical interpretations. So um, just to summarize, I've given you an overview of variant effect mapping, talked about maps at different vitamin B6 concentrations, talked about um, maps for both CBS and MTHFR in different um, environments. And for MTHFR, we actually did it all again in, the, in this common A2D variant background. And um, I guess I want to close with the idea that there is a strong potential for um, taking this large scale and making maps for, uh, for a large fraction of human disease associated uh, genes. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to take questions. And I just want to say that I'm indebted to a large number of collaborators. And this was a team effort and uh, look forward to speaking in person. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so Dr. Roth, we have a few questions. Um, one was, how do you infer these deployed scores? How do you address compound heterozygosity effects? Um, and have you validated the data with any human CBS activity data specifically? Uh, good question. So we tried, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so we tried uh, something more complicated first, and, and that was uh, we had some enzyme activity data for CBS in particular, um, and uh, from Victor Kosic, who's, who's on the call, and he should uh, yell at me by Q&A if I get it wrong, uh, but we, we basically did uh, a calibration curve between our yeast fitness and the, the enzyme activity data that he had. And so the idea was to go from our fitness scores to activity and then some activity of the two alleles and then, uh, and then take the rank order of that and, and, uh, and work with that. And it turned out that um, we couldn't show statistical significance between that more complicated thing and uh, just adding up the scores um, on, the, on the different alleles. And so we've done that, but I actually still think that the first thing is probably gonna be uh, right, but more right in the end. But, uh, and I, sh I actually do have a, a slide that I should have put in the talk. And so I guess for various patient phenotypes with that diploid score, um, here's age of onset, here's disease severity, and here's supplementation response. And maybe the best one here, I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit, is supplementation response. Uh, this is a, a 0.93 Pearson, uh, sorry, Spearman correlation. And so it is a significant correlation between our dip, map derived diploid scores and, uh, and the supplementation response. Uh, so Victor has a scale for, for, uh, for grading patients by how well they respond. And maybe the, the, another way of looking at the same data is if you, if you show the distributions by fitness, our MAP score uh, for remediable and non-remediable um, patients by his classification, you can see that um, you know, below a certain score, they're, they're much less likely to be remediable, and, uh, but, but the, you know, it, it's in the sort of moderate range where there's more likely to be remediation. 
I hope that answers that one. That's excellent. And Dr. Kozich said, no yelling, you are correct. So, oh, okay. Well done. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, the next question is Have you explored the genomic databases to see how many VUSAs and SNPs are there in this gene, and including that with exomes as well? Uh, yeah, so there, I can't remember, I, I haven't at last checked how many there were in ClinVar, but ClinVar is kind of the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. um, and I, Victor should again, uh, maybe won't, he doesn't have to yell, but he could, he could say, but I think it was roughly 200 pathogenic variants that are out there. Um, but I, I don't remember how many VUSs, I just remember that um, somewhere in the neighborhood of half of them uh, were, were VUS. Um, so, so basically, um, it would be some number uh, slightly north of, of 200 would be my guess. Um, if, but I don't, I actually don't know what's in ClinVar right now. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then finally, last but not least, can you explore your library for variants that increase activity, which may be useful for ERT or AAV gene therapy? That is a more potent allele. Yeah, so so I, I sort of pose that question uh, so, sort of Socratically, but turns out dumbly to Warren Kruger earlier to say had he found the hyperactive variants because we have a bunch uh, from our map. Um, and then I, I, I went back and reread my own paper from a year ago, and, and we actually um, cited his paper uh, to say that, that the truncation variants in the linker that we found um, that were hyperactive were consistent with the hyperactive mutations that he had found uh, in his paper earlier. Uh, and so I, I've asked Jochen to, to get a fuller list because uh, it actually wasn't spelled out in our paper which ones they were. And so I can get those to, to, to Dr. Kruger um, if he wants them, but uh, we have a few to add to the list maybe. Excellent. Okay, and right on time, we're ready to hand it over to Dr. Venditti um, for the last se session of the afternoon. So I'm going to stop talking and hand it over to him.